Thank you for tuning into the Rata Cards podcast at RataCards.com. I'm your host, Patrick Greeno, and today we have Ryan Daly joining us to uh, talk about uh, the agenda. Today we've got uh, Francisco Arcia. Did I pronounce it right? Arcia? Arcia. Arcia. Ar- Arcia. Okay. I think either one's fine. All right. We're going to talk about the Baltimore Orioles, uh, New Jersey's, and uh, Shoei Otani, and Mike Trout. So, uh, Mr. Ryan Daly, would you like to start us off here with the uh, Francisco Arcia news? Yeah, we got Arcia, Otani, and Trout on the agenda. Very Angels heavy. I like it. <laughs> um, so, Arcia, Francisco Arcia became the first player to uh, catch, pitch, and hit a home run in the same game. Um, and this happened probably a couple weeks ago. So if if you miss this news, basically what happened, the Angels got blown out. I forget who was playing them, but the opposing team was up by an insurmountable amount of runs. And um, Arcia started the game as a catcher, and he hit a home run at some point in the game. And towards the latter innings, um, as we all know, position players are known to come and pitch in these blowout games because it's not that wise to use your actual arms when there's such a small chance of you coming back to win the game. So Arcia comes in, he pitches, I think, one or two innings. So he's on the record as a pitcher. Um, and that's never, ever happened before. Um, so I kind of, I, I find it a little fascinating that's never happened before because blowouts happen several times a season and position players are pitching more and more often during these blowouts um so it was just like these weird sort of turns of events that led to this rare thing happening um so we'll see when it happens again uh regardless francisco arcia who's widely known as a or i should say widely unknown um you know, he's going to go down in the record books as the only guy to ever do this. Yeah. You know, I, I think about these kind of like obscure, uh, records and I think about Matt stairs because I think it's, he still holds the record for the, uh, the, the, the most amount of times traded to different teams in, in his career. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's quite a few, but, uh, this is an interesting one because he's doing, this gentleman is doing three different things. Now, if you want to, like, make it even more interesting, I kind of want to see a player go up in the stands and act like a fan for an inning, you know? There you go. Maybe he gets <laughs> ejected from the game, and he comes back and watches. I know that that's happened in uh, in football a few times where a, a player will get ejected, and they'll just show up back in the stands watching the game. Really? But, uh, yeah, I think Marshawn Lynch, that happened a year or two ago. <laughs> um, but, yeah, these are freaky things, and it, they're not, like... Because obviously Francisco Arcia's team completely lost that game. It was an awful, awful game for his team. Mm. But so it's not like a a notable accolade to have on his resume, but right. it is still kind of cool. Um, because he he hit a home run and he caught the game. Like those are two good things. And he he pitched just sort of out of necessity. Um, but there's tons of these weird kind of records and statistics that don't necessarily get mentioned because they're not impressive it was just like these weird turn of events that led to the situation um so i don't think it'll ever happen again but uh you know we'll see for now arcia has has the sole ownership of that title <laughs> it's probably gonna be a while before we see that again yeah <laughs> you know that's that's an interesting uh tidbit i think having this the the triplet of of uh roles being played by a single player in a single game uh, yep. Just really cool stuff. The Baltimore Orioles uh, became the first pro sports teams to wear Braille on their jerseys. So in place of uh, place of the actual like um, team name or like the player last name, rather. Well, actually, I think both <laughs> on these jerseys. You've got the team name and the player name. They're, yeah, it was all Braille. It's all Braille. <laughs> One bump, two <laughs> spaces, a bump, another bump, and another space. <laughs> yeah. A lot of stitching work for whoever makes those jerseys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, gosh, you know, I wonder if any blind person has found that to be in any capacity useful. 
you know, because they're not going up to the players and like feeling the jerseys, you know. So it's almost I like I don't really know what what the experience was like for a blind person. Um, it's obviously a really um, it's a great sort of outreach moment for the Orioles and mm. for baseball to that community. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd be interested to hear what, what, what blind people think of that. And, uh, it's, it's, I'd never, I, I, like you said, it's the first time it's ever happened. And, uh, um, I, I kind of want one of those, jer- like if, if my preferred team were ever to wear a Braille jersey, that might be something I'd would want to buy just for the novelty of it. Sure. I don't, I'm not the kind of guy that buys jerseys. So it's certainly a cool thing. Yeah. I, you know, so I, when I saw this, I was like, gosh, you know, I didn't really think about writing the text, like the syntax on the jerseys in any other language or any other type of language, you know? So the Braille was like, Oh, that's kind of cool. Like totally new and unique idea kind of pointless in a way but i think it's kind of cool to think about like you know instead of like it makes you look at it it's almost like in advertising if you have your ad in print and you tell the publicist to put the ad upside down then when people see it they're automatically drawn to it because it's not like anything else they've seen you Mm -hmm. know and so it creates this kind of like marketing buzz or here this is kind of like the same concept you've got braille instead of english typical standard you know letters and so i think it draws the eyes to uh to to look at the jerseys i think in a more focused manner yeah and the first thing i thought of when this news first came out was basketball i think a couple years ago they started wearing they would have their jerseys in spanish um and there's i think there's two different ways you can look at that there's like the positive way where they're reaching out to the Hispanic community. And then there's the negative way where it's just sort of like a marketing thing to sell more jerseys. Um, every sports team has these crazy alternate jerseys throughout the year just so they can sell them to fans. I get that. Um, but yeah, when the Orioles came out with the Braille stuff, that's the first thing I thought of. I was like, well, it, basketball was doing that with, with Spanish language um, a couple years ago. <clears throat> so it could be a, an interesting trend. I don't know what else, what other language they could delve into. Um, I suppose the Canadian teams, like the Canadian hockey teams and the lone Toronto Blue Jays could potentially do a French jersey. But even that's that's a bit of a stretch. Um, I think they ought to do them all in Sanskrit. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Comic Sans. I Latin. Think. Yeah, Latin. Um, <laughs> Something that people don't use anymore, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like uh, uh, like uh, hieroglyphics. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think this is all marketing, right? It's just another way for people to be yeah. like to focus on something. So I, I thought it was cool. And I would at least partially anticipate this to be done again by another team uh, because – it's like other teams are going to see it. And they're like, oh, we should do something like that. You know, it'd be even cooler if like a team removed all the syntax entirely and it's just blank space. You know? Right. And it's just all you see is like a number or like a logo. And so you, you remove the other stimuli that rec- you know allows you to know what the team or the player name is. <laughs> It'd almost be like a uh, an unlicensed baseball card where it's just the... <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just in, the in real time. Right. Yeah, exactly. That would be a trip to watch because if you take away all of the, the graphics and and the names, I mean, the jerseys look pretty similar. That's the problem with those unlicensed cards. It's like the signifying piece of these players is the cool jersey they wear because yeah. most of them are all gray or white or black. Right. right? <laughs> They're not interesting colors. Um, It'd be kind of boring to watch a game where like there's nothing on the jerseys on either of the teams. All you see is like a blue hat and a red hat, and that's all you've yep. got. <laughs> yep. You know, it, every I think it, in a in a big ways it looked like a like a what do they call that intramural league. It wouldn't even look professional because there's no professional indicators, right? Yep, it'd be like a an after work softball league or something. It's just <laughs> right. kind of very bland and. <laughs> Like the unlicensed stuff is if for those of you who don't really have experience with it, it's just so 
less appealing. Truly. When when the when the team's brand is removed and yeah. there's so much power in that and that's that's why the the top license is so important is because they can use that that brand almost in any way they want, not just on the the picture of the player, but they can put it they can put the the team name on the car, they can put the team logo on the card. I mean it's the unlicensed stuff has very little leeway in that. They can use like the color, the player's face, and I, I don't know what else. Their name. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, if you look at the cards, they'll say like, you know, the Chicago Ball Club because they can't even use the <laughs> team name. They can't say the like, Chicago White Sox, Chicago Cubs, yeah, or Chicago like organization, Chicago. you know. And so yeah, it'll they, say, like Chicago or like Los Angeles or yeah. like Miami. It's like all right. And they're very limited in that way, and that's that's the big drawback of not having license and I, it's going to the collector mindset a lot of us you know we want to see the licensing we want to see the players team and the team logo we, that's important to us a lot of us some of us don't care i'm kind of like usually don't really care um and so i i, I don't it doesn't bother me that much but there are some collectors that are real they're purists they want you know, they want the, the logo, they want the team name, they want it to make it just, they want to make it, it's official. But right. when it's unlicensed, it just feels like, I don't know, just unofficial, you know, it doesn't feel like uh, authentic enough to really want to draw money from a wallet to hand over to somebody for something like that. So um, mm -hmm. I totally get that. Um, so uh, moving on, the iconic Sho Shohei Otani 2018 Bowman Chrome Super Fractor that everybody drooled over, hopefully pulling for all, all the month of May, really, into early June when it was finally pulled. Like, I think June, June 6th when he was, uh, he was called out to be injured. Um, and then it was listed at auction around the time where he was like, you know, the news headline was he's now recommended to actually have TGA surgery. Well, it finally sold, okay? And it sold for over $150,000. Actually, if you add in the buyer's premium, the final closing price is like over $180,000. So huge, huge dollar figure on that one. Um, and the auction house obviously made a ton of money because of the buyer's premium. Yeah, 184056 That was wow. the final closing price. You know, I... I I think about it, I'm like, well, if he, you know, uh, didn't, hadn't been required to have surgery, would we have seen a higher number than that? You know, I mean, it's so high at that point, it's squeezed out most collectors. Someone who can drop that kind of cash, I mean, that, that kind of money is spent on baseball cards every month through various right. auction houses. Like, it's not a new figure, a hundred, you know, $86,000 is happen. It happens all the time, but right. with a modern player who's still, you know, just barely on the scene, you know, it's, 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 a, I mean, it's a pretty big deal. I mean, it's, it's even gnarlier that it brought that kind of return after, um, uh, the request to have a surgery. But I, I think like, okay, he's the first guy since Babe Ruth. He's young. He'll bounce back. Like these are all very notable, worthy headlines, right? And so, yeah, and Otani is a special case because he got the bad prognosis of needing elbow surgery. Um, but after he spent some time on the DL, he came back as a designated hitter and he was a great hitter right. until the end of the year. Yeah. And if you look at when this bidding ended, it ended on the 20th of September. So towards the end of the baseball season, um, he had shown some great moments at the plate. And I think he had more or less proved himself as a legit two-way player. Um, and he's going to have TJ, or he already had TJ surgery, I think, yesterday or two days ago. He's going to recover, and he can come back on opening day as a hitter, and he can hit all next year. Really? So, it's yeah, it's what makes this card so interesting is because it's a gamble in one part because – he could come back from his surgery and not be as an effective pitcher. Yeah. Sure. I get that. Right. But he's shown some tremendous hitting prowess through the months of August and September. He's going to, he finished, I think with like 22 home runs. Um, and he, he can continue doing that, uh, next year at the plate. He'll be just be a DH for the angels. 
Um, so this card's going to continue to just to grow in value um, because he's not really going to see any significant downtime as a player. He'll see significant downtime as a pitcher, but you know the the ceiling on him as a hitter is is raised. I think at this point, um, if he's just going to focus full time on hitting next year, mm. he could be very dangerous at the plate. Yeah, yeah. I've... So this this card is it's 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 special in a couple different ways, and Otani being such a dynamic player. Um, you know, I, I get I get the ending price. Like it kind of makes sense to me. It's yeah, it's a huge it's a huge price to kind of wrap your head around. But right. um, like you said, he's young. He's just sort of on the scene. I mean, he could be the future of baseball in the in the coming couple of years. Well, I'm rooting for him, right? So like I I'm, I'm all about this guy. I think he's fantastic. Awesome for the hobby. Awesome for the sport. You know, if he has a surgery on his elbow, fine. He can still hit. I think it's great. I mean, it's just a really cool set of skills to have. You're very versatile. You know, if something happens for one of your roles, you can switch over to your other role while you're healing on your, you know, while, while the previously uh, yeah, um, injured role is, is healing. So I think that it's a really great set of circumstances that are happening for this gentleman. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised by the end price for a couple of reasons. One, the notoriety of the card, obviously, but also two, the international intrigue of the player. You know, he's got large market in Asia. Large. It's probably oh, yeah. more it's probably yeah. more than any of us will ever know. And so and and also there's a large market here in the in, in the western the States. I mean, I'm a fan, like I don't own any of his stuff presently, but I think, you know, if there's no if there's any good car any super fractor to own of this guy, this is the one. I mean, he's over the last couple of months, so many super fractors have been pulled and sold on eBay of, of Otani. And you're, you're closing in like three or four or five hundred bucks for some of these, and some a little higher, and they're all over the board. But this one, obviously, being the the king of the super fractors, and um, it's just it's just a beautiful card. If you you know if you're listening to this outside of the blog, go to the blog and type in Otani in the search bar, and you can uh, you can see this card if you want to. I've blogged about it. And it's just a great scan. Really cool stuff. I, I'm, I I got to hold this card in person at the National. I got to see this card in person. And it's just a really beautiful uh, specimen example. Just a great, great card. Awesome, awesome card. So, yeah, 100 and, well, it was 150, uh, over 150,000 before buyer's premium and over 180,000 after. So the auction house made serious coin on this card. Uh, so... Cool stuff. I really just want to touch on that. I think it's great. Speaking of super fractors, a couple of, I think, uh, in a recent podcast, we discussed a uh, Mike Trout super fractor from 2018 Tops Chrome, the uh, 1983 design. Yeah, I love those cards. <laughs> those aren't the awesome. I mean, we, we talked about the gentleman who pulled it and he tried to get 150 k out of the gate uh, because he, he knew that Vegas Dave paid 400000 for the 09, which is a completely different set of circumstances. Um, well, he finally listed auction style, and, you know, uh, for a hundred starting price, and it closed at thirty-eight bids at forty-six hundred dollars. Well, four thousand six hundred five dollars, which I, I, it was, you know, about a grand, a grand and a half, two grand more than I thought it was going to go for, but certainly I think more reasonable. Obviously, the market's going to, you know, um, identify the actual market value for the card, which they did. And I think for the card itself, forty six hundred is is very fair, um, especially if if Trout continues and keeps it up. It was a great buy. I mean, it's a great card, awesome set. Um, the seller made out, I think, very well uh, mm-hmm. at forty six hundred dollars. You know, and, and you know, we talked about this before, Ryan. That like some sellers will list stuff really high because they really just have no interest in selling any of it. These things, and then. Some guys get around to actually listing them at at normal, like letting letting the market decide prices, and yep. they they can make out pretty well. This is one of those instances, like forty six hundred dollars for a trout superfractor that's modern. You know, he's well into his career, right? So, um, forty six hundred dollars, it's a great it's a great great pull, I think. So yeah, I mean trout, um, it, it's it's a big card, um, and I, we were, we were talking sort of off the podcast about how, how much we like that the 83 
kind of throwback thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, since Trout has been such a juggernaut in baseball since he came up, he's got a lot of super fractures. He's got a lot of rare inserts, rare parallels, autographs, all that fun stuff. Mm-hmm. So by the time you get to 2018, I don't want to say like a super fractor is insignificant, but it's it's a little less significant just because he's got a bunch of amazing stuff on the on the market. Mm-hmm. And the the first asking price, what he he put it up for what 150? The but, first time was 150k, yes. Yeah, exactly. So that's I mean he was or whoever was selling it was obviously a little delusional <laughs> because they're you know it's if you have a big trout card you're like oh man I can get some serious coin for this and. Uh, um, I'm glad that the seller sort of came to their senses. I think 4,600 bucks is is a great pull for that card. Well, you have to you have to remember that the, the <laughs> logic the logic was that that you know somebody paid um, 400,000 for a Trout Superfractor. Maybe I can get a portion of that. So I, I understand the logic there. I do, but yeah. I also have to consider too that the, the 400,000 dollar purchase um, was because of the significance of the card. It being you know. Trout's most iconic pre-rookie year card that everybody wants, you know, that the 09 Bowman Chrome, uh, it's on card autograph, you know, and so, uh, that's, that's why it was such a big deal. Now, I, so I get why he priced it. Now I'm looking at like the actual original listing of this. He actually, the bin for that was 198,000 with a starting bid of 150,000. That's what it was. But then he let it ride. Um, and this was, the September 15th. He let it ride and it closed at September 22nd at $4,605 for the card. Again, like I said, great return on the card. Even though it's not six figures, it's a solid four-figure card. And so um, I was actually pretty pleased to see that number because I, I, I was thinking like 2500 bucks, you know, like mm-hmm. maybe 3000 but it, it well exceeded that. You know, he did, mm-hmm. the seller did really well. And so... Um, Whatever the case, I think the buyer did. Uh, made it was a it was a good decision to, to 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 buy this card. I thought. Oh, so it's on card. It looks like I'm actually looking at a closer scan of this thing. It's not. Yeah, a sticker. I'm looking at it too. It looks like it's on card. Yeah, it's nice. It's really and, nice. And let me let me tell you how simple this is. Well, it's not simple if you have a card like this. It it can be a little complicated, but. All I did, I went to eBay, I put in Trout Superfractor, yeah. and I filtered by sold listings. Now, if you have a Trout Superfractor, obviously you're not going to find your card on eBay because it's a Superfractor. You have the only one. Mm-hmm. But just look at what other Superfractors are selling for. There are plenty of examples Yeah. if you search for what I just said. Um, and even if something similar isn't quite listed on eBay, you can still kind of get a sense of what the market's going for. They're all you over know. the board. I mean, the end prices are. I mean, I'm looking at them. They're a couple hundred all the way up to a, thou- a couple thousand. You know, and so there's no end. Well, there's there is an end, obviously, but the, yeah. the, there's there's a wide range of a variety for super fractors for whoever you collect, especially if your player's been playing for eight or ten years. You know, Trout's been at this for a while now, and so he's got. A, a wide range of super factors available and that you know is there's good and bad to that the good is that people have um opportunities to own trout super factors and i think no matter what you collect it, it doesn't matter the card a trout super factor is a great addition to any collection i think and so um and even if it's an unlicensed don russ card i mean panini panini makes some great looking they call them gold vinyls Great looking super fractor type cards. I like them. I think they're great. Um, but then if you want to get a little bit more, your feet wet a little bit more and spend a little bit more money, you have options. And so um, this particular car we're talking about comes from 2018 Tops, uh, that 1983 silver pack thing. Um, I, I think it's cool, you know, and, and I'm a big fan of, uh, of these cards. We're going to discuss um, another. Mike Trout here in a minute, but if if like like Ryan was saying, if you want to search for what's kind of been floating around the market recently, you just go to eBay and type Mike Trout Superfractor and organize by highest first and just kind of scroll down or lowest first and scroll down depending on how you want yeah. to see the listings. It's it's really cool to see what's been surfacing, surfacing, and you can also see which cards have been 
purchased specifically to flip because there's a lot of that happening in the market all the time. Yes. And if you, I think my favorite one, if you search for what I just said, you know, trout, super fractures, soil items, I think my favorite one is a 2015 Topps Chrome Kershaw Trout yeah. Dual Auto. Yeah. And that has been relisted. Right. Um, for So, yeah, it sold on August 20. They paid. Well, actually, yeah. more than that because they paid just over 1500 it's a PWCC 3, listing. Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah. 1500 it was sold and now the, the the seller has real estate at 3500 bucks. I mean, yep. okay, fine, you know, like I try to myself I try to I try to be the buyer or the first time at surface so I don't have to worry about trying to get give a profit to the next the, the first owner. I did that with uh, a Trumbo card earlier this year and I'm completely happy with the purchase, but I had to pay I think like $100 more for the card than the guy bought it for. Cause I think it, it sold for like two twenty, and the guy wanted three twenty five. Like, I think if, if I can recall correctly how that work went down, but I respected it. And I was like, I, I want to make sure you get a profit. Just can we work this out? So it's fair, you know, like don't gouge me, <laughs> you know? And so, um, like it's, you know, we go back to just let the market decide, you know, I get that you want to make a profit fine, but, Try to be realistic about it. I'm not sure if $3,500 is realistic for that dual auto. It might be. I, I don't know. Uh, might be a might be too ambitious. I mean, just I guess we'll just kind of have to see where that goes with that card. Cool card, by the way. I like that card too. Um, yeah, super cool. Moving on. Uh, speaking of Mike Trout stuff, a uh, 2011 Tops update. You know, classic uh, US 175, the the rookie card that everybody wants. That does really well and just a base card and a 10 sells for like six to seven hundred bucks like right yeah. in that range um the platinum one of one sold recently for a hundred grand i actually wrote about this on radicards.com if you're listening to this elsewhere uh cruise on over to radicards.com and go to the blog area and type in trout the this particular card was um listed at, at over 300k OBO and it sold for 100k. The gentleman who bought it actually sent me a message through radicards.com and said, "Hey, you should write about this." I was like, "Yeah, that sounds great." Um, so I wrote about it because it's such a significant purchase for a card that's not autographed and it's not a super fractor. It's just a one of one paper platinum bordered card. Cool card. I actually wrote about this card uh, in with another uh, block of basically every variation that's ever been seen of the 2011 Tops update Mike Trout card. Um, I talked to the owner of all these cards. He had the most comprehensive collection of them. And I was like, would it be okay if I publish an article featuring your collection? He's like, yeah, that's fine. So he sent me a bunch of photos and I published them. And this was one of them. So this at one point belonged to this, this particular gentleman. So it's selling for 100K is like, to me, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty hefty amount. I mean, that's 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 huge, right? So yeah. um, it's the hope that Trout continues to perform and deliver Mickey Mantle quality results, uh, then we might be able to see the card continue to return if it ever changes hands again. Uh, great looking card. I'm actually very happy for the buyer. I think it's a solid buy. It's all relative, you know, it's like 100K seems like a lot to us because we don't make a couple mil a year, you know, but <laughs> I think it's this kind of stuff is really cool to, to, to kind of watch and observe the market, how it reacts to certain cards. And uh, this this is a monster. I mean, it's just a serious monster. I, I am looking yeah, back no, on I now, think... like 2011, I should have been buying Tops Update. I just didn't, I, I just wasn't. <laughs> you know, I I am so thankful that I, I bought a little bit of it. I don't own, obviously, any 101 Trouts from that era, but yeah. I have a little stash that I'm proud of. But this 100K um, price is interesting because it sort of kind of puts – the Otani auction that we were talking about into perspective. So Otani, if you remember back earlier in the podcast, closed at 150K. So before the buyer's premium. And that Trout, like you said, the Trout 2011 Tops Update is like one of his most sought after cards. And it's a Platinum 101. Yet, you know, Otani from 2018 can fetch a little more. I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting. Otani's just sort of started this crazy 
frenzy in the hobby. I get it, but um, well, I don't. I don't think he started it. It's been around. I think it started with the Strasburg Superfractor in 2010. That's when it really like hit hit the ground running, and it turned the Superfractor into the everybody wants Superfractor mentality. Um, that that changed the entire landscape of how people perceived one of one superfractors. I say that because there are some superfractors, believe it or not, that are numbered to more than one. Uh, it's weird. I think it's like there's something in Topps Chrome for football um, that's numbered to 10, and they're superfractors. Really strange. I think a superfractor should be designated to one print run, but that's just my own, it's my own opinion. But the Otani card's autographed, and it's a superfractor, the most desirable appearance of a card, I think, of, of any card. And he's just now on the scene. A lot of hype around it. I get it. The Trout is uh, the official rookie year card of Mike Trout. And it's one of one, not superfractor, not autographed. Still raked in six figures. I mean, this is like newsworthy, right? I blogged yeah. about this, like I said. Hop on over to radicards.com. Take a look at this thing. It's awesome. Really cool stuff. I like the... Um, the platinum card because it's one of those ones we might not see change hands again. I mean, obviously the Otani, you know, we might not ever see change hands again either, but you know, the Strasburg changed hands like several times before it, it was finally acquired for the final time, you know, by yours truly. But the, the trout card is iconic because of these reasons that it's not autographed and it's not a super fractor. It's just one of those, like, I think the Platinum Border stuff is cool myself, but I think it's very underrated, you know, in my opinion. I think people chase Super Fractors more than they chase, like, Red Paper One of Ones or Platinum Paper One of Ones. I just think the Super Fractor is just trumps all other One of Ones in so many different ways. Yeah, I would agree. I think there are a lot of One of Ones that people may not be aware of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's... It's like unintentional one of ones, I guess. <laughs> if you go if you go back to like the eighties and nineties, certain era cards and then modern stuff, they're like you said, they're certain variations on uh low number parallels that mm -hmm. are one of ones. Um they're unstated one of ones. You know, like uh, I think that Alan and Ginter um and Gypsy Queen might have some unstated one of ones. Like to do it's like sort of super short prints as they call them. Um, you know, it's, there's some weird stuff that kind of flies on the radar. Um, and the, the platinum, I, I would sort of maybe categorize, um, as under the radar because super fractor is such a huge brand from tops. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, super cool card. Um, I, I'd be curious to see if it changes hands again. I, I obviously you have some contact with the seller, um, no, the buyer. Well, uh, yeah, actually, sorry, actually, buyer. I, I, I mean, technically both. I do because yeah, yeah. I wrote about the collection of the gentleman who owned all these different trout cards from Topps Update 2011, mm -hmm. and this, the the buyer just reached out to me. Now, I don't know if the seller had a proxy when this card changed hands because I, I feel like there was like some kind of representation there. I don't think it was direct from owner to, to buyer. Um, there might've been an, an, an agent there somewhere, but whatever the case, I mean, gosh, just kind of like, you kind of have to just like look back and remember 2011 and think like, gosh, if I was buying tops update 2011, I could have JD Martinez, Jose Altuve, Mike Trout, Chris Sale. Um, gosh, who else is in that set? That's, that's like desirable. I mean, there's so many guys in that that run, that 2011 oh, yeah. run. That's it's it's crazy, you yeah. know. And I if mean, you try and buy a wax now in 2018, from 2010 or like I guess like 20 2009, 2010, 2011. Mm -hmm. It's all super expensive, and um, yeah. I, I'm glad that I was buying wax at that time. Granted, at a pretty low rate, but I do have some of that stuff that just sort of the, those class of players that came out of that era it just happened to be insanely pack full of talent. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a weird, I mean, we've seen that like, like the, the mid nineties stuff, you know, wax, it's, it's still expensive because there's a lot of guys that came out of that era that are hall of famers. Um, 
Yeah, 97 stuff because people are chasing Beltray now because he's almost a certainty. Yeah. You know, and 95, like people are chasing the Bowman's best refractor, the Vlad. I mean, that, that card that card blew up over the last year because of his all of fame induction. It was already out of reach, out of you know, it's like completely out of reach for 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 me, but I I bought mine literally like a month before, you know, it all went to like, oh my gosh, he made it, you know, like um and so I I I I feel kind of lucky in that way. And I paid 125 for mine raw. Now you can't touch them for hundreds. Like hundreds and nine sell for nearly a grand. So it's like I mean, it's so out of reach now. And the Beltray, I believe, if it's going to react in any different any way, it's going to it's going to have a similar effect. Um, and, and when he gets into the Hall of Fame, don't quote me on that. I can't tell the future. But if it's anything like what's happened with guys that get in the Hall, there's a spike, and then it kind of calms down. But for certain mm-hmm. boutique, super high end cards like ninety five Bowman's Best Refractors, ninety seven Bowman's Best. Um, Atomic Refractors, 97 Bowman Chrome, International Refractors, um, and even some of those really obscure like um, mirror image inverted Atomics, like those super, super high-end, super rare stuff. Um, we're going to see a spike in those. And they, they'll they come down a little bit again, but they'll never reach you know where they were before all the, like, oh my gosh, he's going to be the Hall of Famer. There are a couple guys that are still playing that, I think are just going to be huge in the next five years because of their popularity and where they're going with the hall of fame. Um, mm-hmm. and we, we can talk about that if you'd like, obviously we just talked about Adrian Beltre, um, Justin Verlander, I think should, is going to be a, a big time guy when he's uh, closing in on some of those like retirement numbers. Yeah. Max Scherzer. Scherzer. Sure. These are guys that are relatively Kershaw. new though. Kershaw. Sure. Yeah. But also Yadier Molina, I mean, yep. that guy's a monster. And so, but people are, you know, some people are buying his stuff, but it's not getting the kind of attention that it deserves, I don't think, yet. But it will, uh, because that guy is fantastic. But he's nearing the, the end of his career. Mm. And so, you know, we're going to see, yeah, I think he's a first ballot Hall of Famer myself. You know, he's just fantastic. Yeah. I didn't pay much attention. I haven't paid much attention to him, but I started researching him recently, and he's he's done fantastic in his career, just great. And so I see yeah, him as being a, a Hall of Famer. Yeah, he's a franchise legend. Um, we, we sort of touched on this before in earlier podcasts about. Uh, I think we've used Derek Jeter, Derek Jeter as the example, mm-hmm. um, which is sort of an extreme example because he's obviously like one of the most highly regarded players of all time. Right, played for the best organization in in baseball yeah. um but we were talking about like just trying to secure some of his key rookie cards now because the ceiling on his stuff is just you don't know where it's going to be yeah i mean and so going back to like scherzer kershaw molina beltre i mean but i, I think that well, if you say like scherzer and kershaw i mean they're kind of part of the conversation, but they're, I think they're, because they're still in their prime of their careers, you know, like Molina and Beltre, yeah. I think they're, yeah. I mean, Beltre is at the end. Molina's yeah, they're, nearing they're the end. For sure. yeah. And so, um, uh, those guys are like, they're almost sleepers in a way, even though there's a lot of buzz around them, it's not making yeah. headlines. You know, it's I, like, I would assume that stuff would be easy to acquire. Um, if you're just looking for like a clean example of their key rookie cards, mm-hmm. I, I would think they would be easy to acquire. Um, obviously, like the Scherzer, the Kershaw, those guys have some years ahead of them, and they're still very right. popular. Yeah. So uh, you can still get their stuff at, at an affordable rate. Um, right. But um, yeah, Beltre, Molina. There's there's probably a couple other guys I'm leaving out, but um, I had a list of like three, and I can't think of the third guy. But he's like <laughs> in that market, the, the like that group. Of like, right. holy crap, you're amazing what you're in your career, but people aren't buying you at all right now. Or they yeah. are, but it's just a small amount of people that are doing that. I had another guy in there in the mix, and I just can't remember the name. Well, but there's one, like we've mentioned Pujols before. He's one of the guys. That, yeah, but everybody knows his future. He's going to be first ballot, no question. The thing is, the thing, hey, if, you just, look at his, if you look at his card prices, I don't think everybody knows. I mean, there's, it's there's, weird. 
Isn't that weird? It's, because because you go on eBay, you look at like Pujols, say like Super Fractor, and there's just an abundance of stuff that goes unsold. I don't know if yeah. it's because people got frustrated that he moved over to uh, the Angels and didn't stay purist with the Cardinals, but it's like, dude, you can't like be upset about that. The Cardinals are going to unload, you know, weight that's now overpriced because they bought the prime years. We talked about this before, you know, and so you're going to have collectors like, oh, well, he's with another team. I'm not going to buy him. I only buy Cardinals stuff. So then you got guys unloading their whole collections. This happened with Chris Sale when they moved. He moved over to Boston Red Sox and the Chicago White Sox. Like guys that were just like White Sox collectors, they were selling out their Frank Thomas collection just to buy White, uh, Chris Sale stuff. Now they don't collect at all because you know, they, you know, the White Sox lost their pitcher. And it's weird. There's like this like uh, this loyalty to guys that stay with their teams. But if they move, they you don't want to have anything to do with them. It happens it happened to the Griffey market in a way, I think. Um and so the Frank Thomas market, I think, was by and large mostly unaffected. Um, but, but you know, you see this with guys that get traded off. And so, I mean, whatever the case, Pujols, his numbers, they speak for themselves. Everybody knows where he's going to end up, you know. And, and so, but yeah, right. to, to, its, to your point, why aren't people buying more Pujols stuff? People buy his rookies from 2001, all this, all this 2001 stuff, and still the most desired rookie card from the early 2000s is the 2001 Bowman Chrome Pujols card, which is still huge, huge. It brings in huge numbers. But it was, you know, it was a redemption card. It wasn't a pack inserted autographed card. It was part of a redemption process. So um, I'm a huge fan talking about Pujols. I think he's a big deal. But there was a third guy amongst uh, Beltre, Molina and I can't remember who it was and it just bothers me. I might that's add this onto another podcast line item at, at some yeah, point in the future, but that's the cliffhanger for the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in. <laughs> but I, I I had a list of, of a couple guys and I'm like, man, we should be paying attention to these guys because they're amazing. Um and I'm actually in the market for a a, a Molina. Uh, I'm 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 hoping to acquire a Molina of something, but by the end of the year that's I just want one really nice something of his. Um, mm -hmm. And so his stuff is not cheap, though. I mean, it's, you know, a couple of hundred bucks, you can get something really nice. But that's still cheap, I think, for what it is, for what who he is. I still think Edgar and Beltre stuff is cheap for what it is. You know, um, I mean, Vlad stuff kind of popped, but it was it's always been kind of high. It just popped because of the Hall of Fame. But I think, like I said, that, that 95 Bowman's Best Refractor will come down a little bit. But I still think it's going to be some time before we see... Um. It, well, actually, I don't think it'll ever come all the way down to where it was. It'll always be significant. But that you know that set. I don't know if you know Ryan. The set suffers with centering issues, top to bottom. It's always partial to the bottom. Like it's always mm -hmm. way pushed down to the bottom edge. But um, anyway, sort of going off on tangent here. Um, <laughs> glad we got to talk about some of these rookie guys and sort of like uh, who's blossoming and um, some of the cards in the market. Uh, Ryan, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, well, I mean, we are sort of on the brink of legit playoff baseball now. Yeah. Um, so I think our next podcast will be kind of focused on football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On the football season. <laughs> right. Um, but, uh, I just checked the score actually. And the Yankees beat the A's in their one-game wild card. Mm. So the Yankees will be moving on to the division series. Um, and if you were living under a rock last night, the Rockies beat the Cubs in their one-game wild card. So the Rockies will be moving on to the uh, National League division series. Um, so by the time our next podcast comes out, there will be a lot of playoff games under our belt. Um, and I'm sure some more hobby news. So keep an eye out for it and look forward to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I you know, I'm always doing uh, market research for what's surfacing card wise. If you've been listening or paying attention on the Facebook group, which you should join by the way, um, link in the top header of the blog, right at cards uh, I, I, I'm always talking about like what's surfacing. I'm trying to educate, you know, people on, okay, this is a rare card or like, you know, there's smudgers. Always this card suffers from condition issues because of this reason. That's just kind of fun for me. I like, I like that. So I'm hoping to bring some more of that and like sprinkle that into our podcast as, as I've been doing, because it's just fun to talk cards. 
And, and Ryan's a trooper. He lets me do that. And I think he, he gives, he provides <laughs> a lot of good insights too. So I appreciate that, Ryan. Thank you, sir. Yeah, no problem. Awesome. Thank you for tuning in to the Radicards Cards podcast and radicards.com. I'm your host, Patrick Reno. Thank you again, Ryan, for joining us. And until next time, enjoy collecting. If you like this content, please subscribe. Thank you. Enjoy collecting.